is a diamond, hard, uncompromising, a street fighter. He is cool and calculating, yet his passions run deep. He has reshaped his game according to his country's needs, but has never compromised himself. Never beaten, never satisfied, Steve Waugh is one of ESPN's legends of cricket. Steve Waugh's unbeaten 157 at Headingley in 1993 confirmed his place amongst the great batsmen of his era. He had never been dismissed at the ground and had plundered the English attack, averaging more than 82 for the series. He is a superb middle-order batsman. Millen. Thank you very much strong on both sides of the wicket. He is powerful off both front and back foot. Wax that one, that's going to be four. He's a magnificent square cutter of the ball. You don't need a ball in that area, otherwise you perish. He is an athletic and reliable fieldsman at gully. Indeed, he's got him a splendid catch by war. And he's been a medium pace bowler of talent and guile. I thought Steve Waugh was a wonderful cricketer from the moment I saw him. I, I thought uh, he was a tremendous timer of the cricket ball. Uh, I saw Steve Waugh from day one as an all-rounder. Because if you remember when he first came on the scene, he, um, he was one of the first bowlers to bowl that slower ball out the back of his hand. I mean, he almost led the way in that regard. It was business, hardcore. Mentally, up there with Alan Boyle is one of the toughest nuts, mentally. If I was in a war, going over them trenches, I'd want Steve Ward on my right hand side, and Ian Chappell on my left hand side, and I think I'd win a few wars, I'll tell you that now. War goes after this, plays a lovely chop for four runs. And Steve War just kept on fighting and fighting and got runs for his team. When he was batting with the tail enders, people used to say, OK, give him a single to get at the tail enders. It never worked with Steve Waugh. He controlled the game when he was batting with tail enders because, again, he was someone who thought a lot about the game and he was mentally very strong. He's as tough as old boots. I think if they're nine down with 180 to win, he'd still say I can get him. You know, that kind of cricket, I win it. And there's not many of those around. But he, he grew up in a hard school. He grew up under Alan Border and with some tough cookies around him. And there it is. That brings up his hundred. He really has played beautifully. A couple of the things that stand out about Steve Waugh is his determination to succeed and the fact that he can come through under pressure. There are not many batsmen in world cricket or through history that, are, uh, that you can confidently say, um, I'd like this guy to bat for me if, uh, if I needed him to. Oh. Yeah. And has he caught him? He has indeed. He's got him. War has made his name as a batsman, but he has engineered a number of Australian victories with his tight, medium pace seam and swing bowling. The thing about Steve War as an all rounder, it's not just batting and bowling, it's also fielding, it's his captaincy, and it's also that pragmatic attitude that he has to his sport. It's, that's why he was a great soccer player. He's one of those blokes who'd be good at anything he did. Steve War. On his court. As captain, War has led Australia to a record-breaking sequence of wins. Through my era, one of the hardest cricketers I've played against. I think most people would say that. Um, uh, he, he was the guy who often, when you felt that England could be getting on top of a test match, had the ability to, to turn it and turn the screw on a side. So he's one of those guys that when he's in your team, he's the sort of guy you want in your side because he's a ruthless campaigner. As, pro as far as an opponent is concerned, I played against him quite a bit. He wasn't captain of Australia yet, he was just a player. So he, he was a tough opponent. Steve 
War made his debut for Australia in 1985 at the age of 20. He had played just 11 first-class games. His first 20-odd test matches, he still hadn't made a run in test cricket. And his first 100 came about uh, Headingley, first test, 1989. And I was batting with him, and I was fortunate enough to be with Mark Taylor, and he's made his first Test 100, and he got out, but he's made 100, so that was great. And his first 20, Steve Walt, was disgraceful. And I remember walking down the pitch, and I was a senior player, and I looked at him, and I said, how are you going? And he said, oh, I'm playing awful. God, it's embarrassing. I said, what are you going to do about it? Said, that's it, I'm going to smash him. And smash him he did. Any room outside off stump, the signature Steve Waugh smacked it through point and he got 175 not out. Steve Waugh was tough because he uh, typified everything that Australian cricket was all about, that, that uh, it isn't over till it's over. Yeah, Steve, uh, when he began, uh, someone stuck a rope round his neck with a great big rock on it and, and labelled it uh, Stan McKay II. Now, Tiger O'Reilly wrote always, I've never seen anyone who looks more like McCabe. That's a terrible thing to, it's like saying, here's another Bradman. And um, every time Steve got out to a loose shot, it was, well, you know, just, that's the way McCabe would have played, so we can't worry too much about this. That didn't do Steve any good at all. Stephen Moore, when he first came into Test Cricket, was regarded as something of a dasher. Uh, he was someone who liked to play the hook shot uh, and liked to play his shots all round. I remember an innings he played actually as night watchman against England in Perth in 1986-87 where he hooked Ian Botham for six. Uh, there's no question that he was very much a shot player. War's aggressive approach may have hindered his Test career but it enabled him to excel in the one-day game with both the bat and the ball. Well, this is trouble. He's going to be out. He is out. Four marks to war here. Had the confidence to bowl a slow ball. He was a very good utility player. Uh, very good in the uh, middle order and also great with the ball. He, he, he could win you games in the, in the, and also win you the game in the field through a ridiculous throw or somewhere. By the middle of 1989, War had played more than two dozen test matches, but had not scored a century. His batting average was barely above 30. The big scores finally came in the 1989 Ashes series. He made his first century in the first test at Headingley. There it is. He punches the air with delight and why not? That's been a brilliant first test hundred. Brilliant. He went a lot of test matches before he actually he made a hundred. And uh, in 1989, the tour of England was just magnificent for him. I think at one stage there, he's, he had scored over 500 runs without losing his wicket. And it seemed to me that um, all the shackles were off. It took three months to get him out, I think, in England at that stage. It was just a stunning play. Look, he had some mental flaws but he changed it all from 92, 93 because they realised you can't bowl that side off stunt to him because you get hurt, so they bowl it really tight. Well, Steve Waugh then, very good off the legs, fantastic slog sweep that he brought into play, but he really thought about the game and where he wanted to go. The glories of 1989 proved to be a false dawn. A season later, War was dropped from the Australian Test team, replaced, ironically, by his brother Mark. When he got dropped, I think it was in the early 90s, uh, 1991 around there he actually went back into his game and he was replaced by his brother Mark believe it or not so he said he walked up to him congratulations you're on the team but and he said oh it'd be great playing with you so well actually you've replaced me so that'll be hard to take for your mum and dad wouldn't it but uh, he, he was a wonderful player in regards to he really sat back I think got into a room had a quiet wine and sat down and said well, okay what are my strengths what are my weaknesses now how do I become a better player and he worked it out very well. From that point onwards, it shows clearly that, you know, he, he decided how he was going to play and it may have coincided with the fact that he did decide at that time not to take the short ball on um, as well. And uh, from that period, he probably would have averaged 75 for the next 80 test matches, which is phenomenal, really, which shows a sort of drive and desire and the levels which he would have got to, which probably so few batsmen of that of that era were capable of achieving.
if you're going to play at the top level for any length of time, and certainly this was the case in the 80s and 90s, you had to be a good player of short pitch bowling. Now, uh, Stephen's desire to go for his shots when the ball was banged in short got him found out a couple of times in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, and in fact, in 1990-91, uh, that particular summer against England, he was dropped from the test side completely. His brother Mark came in and took his place, and then the tour of the West Indies that followed, again, he found himself very much on the outer. As a result of that, he reassessed his, his uh, technique and his career in general, and he tended to uh, shy away from the short ball in, ten, in terms of uh, playing shots. 89 Ashes series played well, but then came back to Australia and a uh, run of uh, poor scores saw him drop from the side. And I think it was that period out of, the, out of the test arena that really sort of made Steve Waugh the player he is today. Steve Waugh was recalled to the Australian team in the summer of 1992-93. It was a new beginning and he was determined to make the most of it. In his period of uh, being out of the test team, he decided um, the hook shot wasn't you know, going to be part of his armoury. He was just going to get out of the road of the short ball and wait for bowlers to bowl in the areas where he wanted to play the play. And he's been very successful at it. He realised that he had too many shots. He realised he wasn't mentally tough. He, he systematically went about writing books and diaries and ever since he started to do those, he really became a good player. Whether he got distracted outside the game or thought too much about the game, he needed other distractions to take him away from his thinking. Going for a big one, that's easily six. Most people through my era would, would regard Steve Waugh as one of the mentally toughest players I ever played against. For knowing your game as well, for knowing your limitations and knowing where you're going to score your runs. I mean, anyone who can go through, a, say, 80, 90 test matches without taking a short ball on and chalk up, I don't know, 20 test centuries in that period of time has to be mentally strong. Play shots like that. With his place now secure, War set about establishing himself as one of the greats of the game. I don't think I've ever met anyone like him for mental strength and, and, and belief, strong belief uh, in himself like uh, Steve War. As a batsman, gee, uh, like tough, hardcore, won't give an inch. Typical Australian, there's this famous photo I see of him, he's got the cap and he's got the fly sitting there of him and looking hard as nails. Uh, he, 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 I was really, I'm really happy to have played with him and against him, and, but gee, you want him batting for you because he, he's killed that many teams over the years. In 1995, Australia travelled to the Caribbean to challenge the world champion West Indies and the toughest man in cricket stared down the game's most fearsome attack. Steve Waugh stood out um, because he stood up there and you've got that great photograph of Steve Waugh and Kirtley Ambrose where uh, only someone else's long arm pulled Kirtley away in time. Steve hadn't said anything to him, Steve just stood there and looked at him. And uh, that was Steve's way. After his man of the series performances against the West Indies, Waugh's wicket had become the most prized in world cricket. Gutsy, not very attractive looking when he, when he come out to bat, very positive, he stays on the crease, he wants to stay on the crease all the time. You see, it's, for me as a bowler, it's very annoying. The batsman who doesn't give his wicket, doesn't want to give his wicket, he was always there. So there it is, Stephen Moore, and that brings up his 150. Steve Moore. Made 10 scores of 150 in test matches. That's a fabulous record. You know, he not technically the soundest batsman you'd ever find, but he played within his strengths. He didn't take too many chances. He was mentally strong. Short balls wasn't comfortable against it, but he still didn't disturb him mentally. War now ranked alongside Lara and Tendulkar as the world's best batsman but his finest achievements still lay ahead. In 1999, he became captain of the Australian Test and One Day teams. When uh, Taylor retired, and it was a question of uh, which player would become captain, and um, as I mentioned, uh, my statement was I can see absolutely no reason why Steve Waugh shouldn't captain Australia. 
Still can't. Initially, when he took over, I don't think he was letting his instincts control his captaincy. He was doing things by the book. And we had this conversation, um, and I said to him, mate, you know, you've got great instincts for the game. Looks to me that you, you're not sort of letting them sort of flow through into your captaincy. In Steve War, you have this quite complex character who's trying very hard to be accepted because, you know, he got given a, a lot of flack too. He wasn't uh, necessarily rated by everyone as a great captain. Uh, he wanted to be all those things. He wanted to be a good all-rounder. He wanted to be a good player. He wanted to be accepted uh, for what he was doing. Going into the 1999 World Cup, War was playing as well as ever, but doubts persisted about his captaincy. Australia had a very poor start to that particular tournament. His captaincy was being questioned, and in the end, the side had to uh, remain unbeaten for its last seven or eight games in order to lift the trophy. It really was a huge achievement to do that. They were having to play the best sides at a time when those top sides were in much better form on paper than the Australian team. Australia were one game away from being eliminated. Then the skipper took command. It's all very well being uh, a fair weather player. Uh, I've, I've always been inclined to want to judge um, the good cricketers by how they perform when the chips are down. And I think the 99 World Cup was an example of how um, certainly Steve Waugh uh, took the, the game against South Africa by the scruff of the neck. There's no doubt about that. Who can forget uh, the successive games against South Africa in that tournament at Headingley where Australia had to win in order to qualify for the semi-finals. They were struggling after South Africa had posted a substantial score and Stephen Waugh came in in the hardest of circumstances and made a quite brilliant unbeaten 120 to take Australia to victory. Through really skillful captaincy and from a, a hopeless position in that tournament, Steve Waugh was able to uh, lift his side to a new level of performance and they were able to lift the trophy. The World Cup win was remarkable, but for War and his Australian team, the best was yet to come. After the 1999 World Cup victory, Australian cricket enjoyed the most productive period in its history, encompassing a world record 16 consecutive test match victories. And always, Steve Waugh led from the front. My simple plan was to bomb him, basically. <laughs> just to bounce every ball. But again, I realized uh, early on when he comes in, just more a little bit in-swinger to him because he goes on a back foot first and then he comes on a front foot and that's where you have a chance to get him. But I think eventually he became uh, uh, too shrewd as a batsman. That's why he goes a lot of runs against the best attacks. Steve Waugh was a dogged batsman. Yes, got a lot of runs and he wasn't the most elegant batsman that you would look at and people used to say he was successful to the shot ball. He didn't look good against a short ball. I will agree with them, but not too many short balls got him out either. War's captaincy style was especially suited to a team of such phenomenal talent and depth. He was one of those original blokes who took some serious removing from the crease. Um, probably one of the mentally toughest cricketers I played against. Um, was quiet, would choose his words on, on, a, on a field of play. When he became captain, he set about making sure that the team was as relentless in that, what some people like to call a dead rubber. I mean, it was still a test match as far as he was concerned. It was in a dead rubber that War yet again showed his legendary toughness. He scored an extraordinary century in the last test of the 2001 Ashes series. Towards the end of the England tour, where he got 157 not out on virtually one leg after he'd torn a calf muscle a couple of weeks prior to that last innings he played in the Ashes series, he averaged something like 79 over his previous 15 test match innings. Uh, and that for a chap who, uh, in the normal run of things, would be coming towards the end of his career. He'd passed 36 at the start of the Ashes tour. That really is a phenomenal achievement. What, what a, an innings he played at the Oval against England on one leg and it just said everything about him that yeah I'm injured I perhaps shouldn't have played I've made a wrong decision in that game at the Oval um, so to rectify that I need to get a big hundred well he got 157 not out in that game and then hobbled out and 
and captain the side and knew that he couldn't have a runner or a substitute fielder. He's as hard as nails. He's, a, he's what epitomises Australia cricket for me. After that series, Walsh suffered a lapse in form. As captain, he led his side to just one loss in the following 16 tests. But as a batsman, he could only pass 50 on five occasions during that period, with his place in the team in jeopardy. There's no doubt that War came into the last test of the 2002-03 Ashes series, about to be sacked. He had only scored 100 in his last 16 tests, and the chairman of selectors had basically indicated to him that he thought it was a good time for him to finish up. Sydney, War's boyhood home, provided the backdrop for perhaps his most dramatic and arguably his finest moment. With his position seemingly riding on his performance in the final Ashes test of 2002-2003, War returned to the swashbuckling nature of his youth, flaying the England attack to all parts of the ground. He quickly reached the 90s, along the way becoming just the third cricketer to complete 10,000 test runs. In an ending straight out of a Hollywood movie, War dispatched England off-spinner Richard Dawson to the boundary on the final ball of the day to bring up his most famous hundred. During the innings, War became the third player to score 10,000 runs in test cricket. And you look at the people he joined, Border and Gavaska, they were two tough cricketers and War's a tough cricketer. You know, Steve War too. Fantastic, and I think it was all summed up when we went to the Sydney Cricket Ground that day and everyone thought, well, this was the end of Steve Waugh. Well, it wasn't the end of Steve Waugh. He just kicked on and on and on. Although uh, cricket is of uh, immense importance, uh, there are certainly other things in life that are more important than cricket. Uh, he does other things. Uh, he writes, he takes his own photographs, he produces books. Uh, he's very good and with uh, regard to life off the field, yes, he does have a rounded view of things. The fantastic thing about working with Steve on his books is that the books, because of the nature of the bloke, go far beyond cricket. And I mean, that's most reflected by his, his affinity with India. And he has a real love for India and a real respect for the Indian culture. The kind of thinking that he brought in, the, kind, the way he made Australian cricketers look, look out of themselves, uh, and he had a great sense of history and tradition. And he could, he could always see the wider, bigger picture, the wider picture. And in, uh, particularly in, in terms of his relationship with India, where he, he actually got the Australian players to see India in a new light, see it differently and, and enjoy that experience. In 1998, war was moved by the plight of leprosy afflicted children in Calcutta. He has since devoted countless hours to raising funds for the Udayan home for the daughters of leprosy sufferers. We as Australian cricketers spend a lot of time in the subcontinent now. Uh, you go to places like India, uh, there's a billion people in India. But with a billion people, you know, come, you know, certain problems. And uh, Stephen obviously inquired about how he could help and it's gone from there. He was committed to that cause even when he was he was playing and he raised a lot of money and uh, he went and played cricket with them. That made not only uh, made a huge difference to the lives of those children, but it made a lot of Indians see leprosy in a, in a different light. War has a vast knowledge of the game, a keen sense of its history and his Australian team's place in it. I think he, he was mentally tough. Um, he, uh, he didn't... Um, and he didn't back off anything. I mean, it, it, there were times when he didn't really look as if he was handling the fast, the, the, the short pitch ball very well. But he got through it. And I mean, you know, that's that's a great credit to him. You know, again, you know, he'll go down in Australian cricket history as one of their great players. Steve is fully aware of the history of the game, and I think he's fu he's fully aware that he's a part of that history now. And he wants to be remembered as a great cricketer. He also wants to be remembered as a, a winning cricketer. And uh, his ambition for himself and for the team is always to be as good as they possibly can be. One thing War will always be remembered for is his trademark original baggy green cap and the pride and passion with which he always wore it. Stephen's original baggy green's in a pretty shabby condition. At the end of the Ashes Tour of 2001, the, uh, the felt was starting to come away from the peak. Uh, of course, uh, one of the problems that, that he's encountered is that uh, beer's been tipped on it so many times in celebration of Australian victories, particularly in the recent past uh, with him being captain. But I think um, Stephen will ensure that cap remains in one piece because it means so much to him. He gave 
no quarter on the field, which I liked. I like people who played the game hard like that. Uh, so from that point of view, you had to respect him for how he got stuck in uh, and put himself on the line. His powers of concentration was excellent and, and he was a real run accumulator in test cricket. So definitely you'd rather want him in your side than against you. One year after his SCG heroics against England, War retired from international cricket at the same venue. The series against India saw record attendances as the Australian public said goodbye to one of its favourite sons. As a batsman, Steve Waugh is amongst the elite group to average more than 50 over a long career. He was a handy medium pace bowler and an outstanding fielder. He grew to be an excellent captain. He's one of ESPN's legends of cricket.